my mother has a philosophy. Actually, she has many philosophies, but there's one that I want to talk about. And this philosophy says that unless you know your options, you can't make a right decision. And that is the reason why, when I was a child, I would go through all the courses on ceramics, dancing, sports, musical instruments. And it's also how I got into the Astronomy Club of Bratislava when I was nine. And it worked. Three years later, when I was 12, I decided that I would become a scientist. But I didn't feel like waiting until I get my degree and all the education that I need. I wanted to be a scientist right now, so I became one. And I was extremely persistent, extremely stubborn, and even annoying. I started to download scientific papers from the internet, translate them word by word, because I didn't <laughs> speak English well. And I remember once I needed data from a space telescope for my research. And of course, I couldn't get the access to it, because I wasn't even a university student. I was 12. So I decided to just email the person who was in charge of the world database. And I was like, yeah, hi, I'm 12 years old from Slovakia, girl. <laughs> Please get me data. And they did. They actually gave me the data. And after this, I was getting better and better. And I was actually getting my first scientific results. And this exploded when I was 16. And I managed to find the proof that there is a certain magnetic field amplification process going on in these nice space clouds. And with this research, I traveled to the US, to the biggest science fair in the world. And there, I won the first prize in the category of physics. I also got a special award by CERN, by Coalition for Plasma Science. And today, if you go out at night and you look, I believe it's this direction from this position, you'll see a minor planet named after me as a recognition for my research. <laughs> Actually, you won't see it because it's so small and so far away. But we don't talk about it publicly, but every scientist wants to have that something named after themselves. Equation, process, diagram, something. So I, I, now I can just retire, you know. No, kidding. Anyway, after this, my life exploded. I started to travel the world to conferences, but I was also put there to, to the public as an inspiration to talk to kids and organize education, educational contests for them. And I realized that I, I liked that just as much, having an impact on society. And Suddenly, I liked both things. I couldn't decide, and it occurred to me that this was not only about doing lectures, about doing educational contests. This was also about the focus on my research. Do I want to go for something really theoretical that I might really enjoy? Or should I go for something more practical that might have a bigger impact on the society? I didn't know. And I had a complete burnout the summer before I <laughs> went to the university. I didn't know what I want to do. And at this point, I realized that I have to step back and see what's in me and what I actually want to do and how I got my motivation in the first place. Because this whole question of motivation, it was so hilarious to me during the whole phase of competitions and high school. Everybody would ask me, like, how did you get this competition? Almost as if it was some form of a disease, like, how did you get Ebola? No. And even it's something so natural to me that I never realized it. And these people, they made it seem like, yeah, we go to dark, cold place, room every night to inject motivation. Yes, no, it's, it's natural. And people would just would not understand it at all. And it's not just me. Also, other friends that I had from these competitions, it's just extremely natural. And that is also what I, what I found out during that summer. Curiosity, scientific curiosity, and exploring the world. It's a human instinct. We need it to be curious, to create tools, explore the surroundings, to get advantage against our enemies in the past all days. It's in us. Ever since we were born, it makes us grow as individuals. Yes, then usually you put the clip to the con conventional education system, and it can, but I won't go into that now. Anyway, every child is a born young scientist. But then there is another interest, another instinct that starts to develop later on in your life. The need to have the impact, some influence on the community. And I call this moral curiosity. And I realized that these two curiosities, these were the interests that I couldn't combine properly. I wanted to do them both, but I, of course I couldn't. And one reason why I'm sharing this with you is that I feel like it's not only my problem, it has actually been a big topic in science in general over the past few years. Just imagine it. Thousands of years ago, science was art, literally art. Hundreds of years ago, and even decades ago, it was a tool for politics to wage wars or win the space race. 
but today we're going to Mars. Not because we're obliged to by politics. No, we go there because we want to, and that's amazing. Science is becoming one of the leading elements in the society. But with leadership comes responsibilities, especially moral responsibilities that we have to the people that we are leading. And these responsibilities, they have never been a part of science before because its position changed a lot in the past few years. <laughs> we have to think about this. And new questions are arising. Is every piece of information that we obtain in science, does it have the same value? Probably not anymore. Should we, should we focus on our research on the current problems in the world, or should we rather do the basic science? I don't know. And this is something really interesting, because I remember that four years ago, when I was presenting my research all over Slovak media, every time I would finish my presentation, that would be that one person in the audience who would just raise their hand and say, yes, but the bread won't be cheaper, so what's the use of this? And you know, back then I was like, oh, this person doesn't understand science at all. But now I realize that they did have a point. Now, I mean, they were not entirely correct, I like the research, but still, they did have a point. And this is still a struggle that I have inside myself today. And after I came to the university, I immediately joined an engineering team um, with the big vision to improve space safety by designing a new 3D metal printer. But after the project was terminated, I was so overwhelmed by the engineering and the morality of all of it, and I didn't really enjoy the science behind it. So I immediately ran to the other part of the spectrum, <laughs> and I focused on analysis of possible experiments to study the dynamics of solar atmosphere. And then half a year later, I was presenting in front of the European Committee for Research, trying to improve conditions for researchers in Europe, again, trying to have some moral, moral impact. So you can see how this has been going on with me over the past few years, actually even months. But I'm getting better. A few months ago, I joined an engineering team at our school, uh, which is trying to lower the fuel consumption of aircraft, basically make air transportation greener. And there, even though this is a very engineering-ish team, there I get to do the pure science, the pure physics. And I realized that in this way, even though your interest might seem disjoint in the beginning, you can find an intercept. The problem is, <laughs> does this work for everybody? Is this the general solution? No. Where or how you find this balance, and if you even find it, depends on how much you value each of these interests. It's going to be individual, and maybe you won't be able to find this intercept at all. What is very interesting in this is that everybody in the scientific community has a completely different opinion on this topic. And if you don't trust me, just go online, use your internet, make two friends, find a very passionate theoretical physicist and find a very passionate applied physicist. And whenever you're sad or bored, just take these two people, invite them for a dinner or something, and ask them, what's the use of your research? And then run away behind the protective glass and let the game begin. <laughs> And I have been in the middle of these discussions so many times, and I still have this inside of me. So really, everybody in the scientific community has a slightly different perspective and sometimes completely different. And there are people who don't even realize that there is this other side of the coin. And that's completely okay. But what is very, very important about this is that it is these opinions of the groups of scientists that are going to determine the future of science, how it is going to transform now. We don't know that yet, but we can watch it. And to sum it up, I have no idea where I'll be in three years. I might be cleaning pigeons from the dirt on German beaches. I, I might be doing astrophysics. And more importantly, we have no idea where science will be in 30 years. What we do know is that it's going to be one hell of a show. Thank you. <laughs>